somehow always forget to hit the record button, but usually it's during my spiel when nobody wants to hear that anyway. So, <laughs> um, so there's also a way for you to participate tonight on um, the comment section in Facebook. So I won't be bringing in the questions live. I might sneak a few to Kate maybe, um, but if you have a question, go ahead and put that into the comment section. We'll bring most of those into the conversation after Susan and Kate chat. So before we get started though, Kate, I'm gonna call you out a little bit because you posted this on Twitter anyway. So just wanted to do a, a shout out to the slippers. You got your slippers on? <laughs> it's the yoga pants underneath the professional looking outfit all the way. I love, well, I got, I got my slippers on. So <laughs> you put it on Twitter and I was like, I gotta, I gotta call out the slippers. <laughs> well, I don't have the thing and I think I think most of the people I know do. I have three Zoom outfits hanging on the back of the office door where it's literally just everything from the top up. It's the shrug, it's the statement necklace, and it's the neutral tank top. Exactly. And it can literally be shrugged over the, you know, Sailor Moon pajama bottoms <laughs> at 30 seconds notice. It's great. It is fantastic. I've made the mistake one time though getting up trying to adjust something and somebody saw those pajama bottoms. <laughs> So anyways, okay, we have chatted enough here. I'm sure Facebook's let everybody know, so let's start the show. And I also want to give a shout out, Susan. I'm sure your mom, Judy, is on here with us. And I, yeah, and I just, you know, we've hosted you at the store countless times and to great packed, always launch day, always to a great packed audience. And like we were talking in the green room earlier, I'm getting chills. It's like a little melancholy that we're not doing that this year. So it's but it's different it'll be great it's gonna be a great conversation mm -hmm. um but judy hi <laughs> we'll see you at the store in that front row because judy and susan were always very good front row attendees of our event so that will happen again soon it day. will so um for those that don't know but again i think everybody knows both of these ladies but i'm doing my due diligence and we'll do the intros here so susan meisner is a usa today best-selling author of historical fiction with more than half a million books in print in 15 languages. Her award-winning novel, yes, that is a, a definitely. Her award-winning novels include The Last Year of the War, As Bright as Heaven, A Bridge Across the Ocean, Secrets of a Charm Life, A Fall of Marigolds, and Stars Over Sunset Boulevard. She is a former managing editor of a weekly newspaper and, award -winning, and an award-winning columnist. She's a California native and attended Point Loma Nazarene University and is also a writing workshop volunteer for Words Alive, which is a San Diego nonprofit dedicated to helping at-risk youth foster a love for reading and writing. We love Words Alive. Joining her today is Kate Quinn. Kate is the New York Times and USA bestselling author of historical fiction. A native of Southern California, she attended Boston University where she earned a bachelor's and master's degree in classical voice. She has written four novels in the Empress of Rome saga and two books in the Italian Renaissance before turning to the 20th century with the Alice Network, The Huntress, and soon to come, The Rose Code. A little plug here, available for pre-order. <laughs> we'll put so that in the it. chat. We'll put it's that so in the comment good. section too. <laughs> All have been translated into multiple languages. Kate and her husband now live in San Diego with their three rescue dogs. So with that, ladies, have a great conversation. We'll see you in about a half hour. Thanks, Julie. Uh, leading off, uh, jumping in with where uh, Julie left off is uh, speaking of the rescue dogs, there's a very good chance we may be interrupted by a dog barking at some point. Um, I can't do anything about it. It's his office. I just work in it. And there are two more down there anyway. So anyway, so um, if that happens, we can all deal. I think uh, mm -hmm. we are all used to the Zoom pets <laughs> interrupting the Zoom events at this point. So anyway, uh, you know, Sue, if we were normal, if this was a normal launch for you, the local San Diego crew would probably be showing up in droves to Warwick, and we'd be like taking you out for Prosecco afterward, mm -hmm. and we'd all be gushing about your book, and I really wish you, we could do that right now. So imaginary Prosecco, and can I gush about your book a little bit for the people who are watching? Oh, that sounds like a good idea. I like that idea. Well, Sue's book, you know, The Nature of Fragile Things, which I just raced through. I just loved it. And 
it is against the backdrop of the San Francisco earthquake, which took place in 1906 and has always been a you know real fascination of mine as far as disasters go. Because writers collect, uh, historical novelists collect disasters like you know heads in a freezer. It's a little ghoulish, not quite as ghoulish as heads in a freezer. We're not Dahmer here, but we do have this list of like, ooh, disaster, lots of people dead. This would be a great catalyst for a book. So Stu <laughs> wrote one for the San Francisco earthquake and I just loved it because it's not just about, you know, a ticking time bomb story down to the moment where you know the earth is going to crack, but it's also about this incredibly moving little band of characters. Mm. And she introduces us first to her heroine, who is a girl so desperate to escape the slums on the East Coast, where she knows there is no way out for her, that she does the impossible and takes the offer to be a mail order bride and marry a man in San Francisco whom she has never met. And you're so inside her head, you know exactly why she would make this choice and why it seems like a great option for a girl in her position. So then you throw this girl into a new situation, a new family, a new husband, all kinds of things to learn. And you know the earthquake is hanging over her head and is about to you know, upend her whole new life that she's built for herself. But even before the earthquake comes along, she ends up bumping into, uh, let's just say two women impact her life. And she realizes that these two women have ties to her and to each other and that they are going to have to figure out a lot of things to come. And then that's of course is when the earthquake hits as, as, as tends to happen. So it's this wonderful mix of action and historic setting and these wonderfully lovable female characters who you can so sympathize with. And you know, again, I brace through this book and I can't wait for you guys to do the same. Thank you, that was well done. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, it's easy to summarize someone else's book. It's hard to do your own, <laughs> right? Yeah, because then your, your, your mind is going down all the plot lines and you're wondering, do you try to summarize that? And before you know it, you've been talking for eight minutes and your audience is sidling out of the room, wondering <laughs> what's on Netflix, you know, here on Zoom. So in any case, uh, really, what, uh, what's a fun tidbit about, the, about this novel? That, first of all, just something fun to share that you think would, they might be interested to know right off the bat. Oh, well, it's fun now to think about. It wasn't fun during the process, but I had to start this thing three times. Like the first, the first 40,000 words, I thought I had a good start, sent them to my editor because I owed them. I owed her some progress pages and um, she had to tell me that it, the story wouldn't work. And she listed all the reasons why. And I didn't have the same characters that I have now. They were different characters. It was the same setting. I had already decided I was going to write on the earthquake. But it was different people, different motivations. It was all different. And she she told me this, this won't work. And the reasons why that she gave me were all valid. I knew she was right, but it was hard. It was hard to throw out 40,000 words and start over again. So then I started over again with these characters. But even so, at 25,000 words, I sent them to her. And again, she told me the way you have it right now, it won't work. And again, she gave me the reasons why. And again, she was right. And that time I really felt like I was a hack. I didn't know what I was doing. I signed up for the wrong gig. But third time's a charm when I finally got down to like the very, very basics of what do these characters want? Why do they want it? And what stands in their way? Which is just basic storytelling 101. I finally got my head around this book. And what came out was the book that people are, are going to be holding in their hands on today. I'm really proud of it. And it turned out to be probably one of my better books. Publishers Weekly liked it enough to give it a starred review. And you know how hard those are to get. And um, so I dedicated the book to Claire, who is my editor. So if you get the book and you open it up and you want to see who's it dedicated to, and it says for Claire, that's my editor who had to do the hard thing twice. And she, but she was so right. And she ended up pulling out of me a really good book. Well, I would say definitely third time is the charm because it, it, it is so clear in this book, the minute you open it, exactly who these characters are and what they want. And, you know, because, you know, this is a question that's going to come up for from somebody in the audience later, you know, for advice for writers. Mm -hmm. Really, there's there's nothing that storytelling comes down to when you boil it to its essence is exactly what Sue just said, which is who is this person? What do they want and what is stopping them from getting it? And those are things that you know immediately about the heroine of this book. And it's things that are going to change over time. As, mm. And the things that are, the obstacles in her way are going to change too. But those are things that you know so well. So Claire, thank you for having to 
write those, I'm sure, very difficult emails to yes. Susan, but it was totally worth it in the end. Although I know the pain of those moments when you're crying into an espresso yeah. and thinking, <laughs> Uh, you know, maybe I should give up and I'm going to go be a professional dog walker, which will be much more fun than this job. <laughs> yes. Even having to pick up the poop, it's more fun. Yes. <laughs> so yeah. why the San Francisco earthquake? What made you drawn to this particular historical moment in time? Well, part of it was, um, this is my home state. I was born and raised here and it's always been of interest to me, that particular event. And the other thing is, um, I feel like I, I've told a lot of stories that have taken place elsewhere um, in Europe, um, on the East Coast, um, Philadelphia, but I live right here and I haven't been looking for the stories that are right here where I live. And I feel like I feel like I should do that. I should see what are some stories that are right here where I'm, where I'm living that are waiting to be told. And that the story of the, of the earthquake just seemed like one of those. There haven't been that many novels written about the 1906 earthquake, some really great nonfiction books, but not as many fiction. I thought it's, it's, it's a chance for me to tell a story and uh, I'm and easier to research too, because it's not that far away from San Diego. So all of those reasons kind of led me to, to hook up with this one. Uh, what kind of research did you do for this book? And, you know, did the, you know, did the pandemic affect that? Mm -hmm. Because when you're thinking, oh, great, I will only have to go, you know, in state, you know, to be able to research. Well, then we hit a period, a, a point in time when it's like, you're not really going anywhere at all. Right. <laughs> Maybe to the curb to get your groceries. But right, exactly. Well, I was able to do all my traveling before the pandemic because I had to turn the book in right before the pandemic hit. So it had been turned in for the most part. And so all the editing was done during lockdown. Uh, but the, the research trip up to San Francisco, I was able to make um, before all of this, which is really important because San Francisco is one of those cities that has had major, major lockdown. It would have been really difficult to, to travel up there and do the same kind of research dive that I did, that I was able to do a year and a half ago. There's a really good book though I would recommend to people. This is of interest to them. It's by Simon Winchester, who has a brand new book out this week. He's an excellent writer, but it's a crack in the edge of the world. And this is his take on the 1906 earthquake. And he writes like Eric Larson. He writes like narrative nonfiction. It's almost like reading a novel. So there was that book. There were several other books that were compiled. Like there were compilations of firsthand eyewitness accounts. Those are really good. The San Francisco Library, Downtown Library has this wonderful history center up on the second floor where you can't check anything out. They're all research materials. But you know, you you check out the box, you wear the gloves, and you and you look at all these historical documents, and it's it's wonderful. And then actually being able to go to the city, even though most of the city was destroyed, there are still echoes of that old life and lots and lots of archived photos. And so I felt like I had enough information to write the, to write the book, even though once we had the pandemic, I was pretty much um, sidelined at home. Now, I know you, you you went through a couple different rounds of characters for this book, especially with a couple different, you know, starts, but what made you ultimately decide on your young heroine who, you know, who is a mail order bride and what would motivate her to take that as a backstory? Now, there's part of her backstory that you learn very early on about why she takes this offer. And then there's another part of her backstory I'm going to leave secret, but how did you sort of come about crafting her as a character? Because I really loved her so much. She was great. Right. Well, there's a picture I'm going to be showing you a little bit later of San Francisco the day before the earthquake and everything looks fine. Everything looks perfect. Nobody knows that the next day all hell's going to break loose for lack of a better word, because everything looks fine. And which is, which is all to say that things aren't always as they seem. And I like that idea that things aren't always as they seem. And I wanted to use it for all the characters, for everything, that things aren't always as they seem. And that's one of the things that Sophie, the main character, realizes after she marries this stranger is that things aren't as they seem. But I also wanted her, who is narrating the story for you, so you feel like you ought to be able to trust her. I wanted there to be things about her, too, that aren't as they seem. And I wanted her to feel like she's... Um, She's not able to go back back home like she's from Ireland. She's an Irish immigrant. She's living in a tenement in lower Manhattan where a lot of Irish immigrant young girls lived. Not a very good situation. She she could just go back home to Ireland and she never ever tells you why she won't. Instead, she takes this opportunity to become a mail order bride and heads west across the United States as far west as you can go. 
which is also indicative that um, she's she's got some secrets that she's not trusting the reader with yet. And it's almost like you just want you just want to know um, you want to know what it is about her that keeps her from being able to be completely forthright with the reader. And of course, it all comes out in the end. Um, but but in the beginning, that's that's what you feel is that things aren't what they seem. Well, and you know, there's so much about her that she doesn't show you share right away, which I love. And then you, you know, the more you learn about her, the more you learn about the other people in the novel as well. And that's one of the big catalysts for it because you're not just rooting for her mm -hmm. in the earthquake by the end. There's this little band of people who come to be part of her world. And that's the key of any disaster story, isn't it? It's not just about the disaster. It's about some little band of people mm -hmm. that have been separated or who have been, are trying to stick together. And it's about, are they going to be able to do that during a moment of tremendous crisis? Now, coming to that crisis itself, I mean, we're looking at San Francisco. It's this glittering boom town sort of, you know, with, with, with millionaires who have built huge mansions on Knob Hill. Mm -hmm. Can I share my favorite anecdote for the San Francisco earthquake? Gotcha. Because the thing that I always loved about it is that, you know, and I would, and, uh, you know, Julie read it in my bio earlier is that I trained as an opera singer. So I always zoom in whenever I hear, you know, things as things about opera in the background. And I always thought it was fascinating that the night before the San Francisco earthquake, there is a famous performance at their opera house of Carmen. Uh, Bizet's Carmen and Enrico Caruso is singing Don Jose. And so therefore you have this band of opera singers that is part of the exodus trying to get out of San Francisco ahead of the earth, after the earthquake and ahead of the fires. And so I always loved that little opera connection. Although, uh, and I know, I remember I grinned as soon as I saw a mention of it in Fragile Things because it's like, yay. <laughs> now Caruso does not show up as a character, but I still love that little uh, tie to <laughs> operatic history. Happened. Yeah. So you said you had some pictures and things to show us. Do you I think do. maybe- I do, I'm gonna- um, totally geek out. Yeah, let me get to, uh, it'll take me just a second to toggle to the screen here. And this particular um, presentation is kind of long, so we're going to have to skip through part of that. I'm not going to show you all of these slides, but um, I can at least show you some of them. I think it'll it'll probably I think aid in your enjoyment of the book. I hope I, I begin by telling people that I was born and raised in California, didn't live anywhere else until I was 25. So to grow up in California is to grow up with earthquakes. And I talk a little bit about what it was like growing up in a place where earthquakes were normal, not huge big ones, not the kind that can destroy a city, but these ones that remind you that the, that the world beneath you is um, it's active and there are things happening below your feet that you can't see. I and the reason, why there was <laughs> the reason why there was an earthquake at all is because there are tectonic plates below us. They're huge. They're not really plates. They're more like gigantic blocks. And uh, they they move, and in between they in between them their boundaries are are faults. And so the big brown one up there is the North American tectonic plate, and the one below it, the yellow one, is the Pacific plate. And so when they got together on 1906 and touched, they moved away. They created this this shift, and one of the plates went this way, and one went this way. That created the earthquake. In the San Andreas Fault, which runs through California, it's that red line that you see there. It, it's all the way from the, like the beginning above San Francisco all the way down you know into uh, almost Mexico. Well, it kind of bisects the, you know California and you can see that San Diego is on the Pacific side. So we're on the Pacific plate and San Francisco, Sacramento, San Jose, the Sierra Nevada mountains, they're all on the North American plate. And so when, when we had that movement on this um, April 18th, 1906, that's what happened is, is the Pacific plate and the North American plate um, they kissed and they shouldn't be kissing. <laughs> and, and, and the result was um, this earthquake. And I have the dishes there just because my great aunt gave them to me. She lived in Los Angeles for the most of her life. And it, this used to be service for 12. But on, on 19, in 1994, there was a rather large earthquake in Los Angeles and she lost most of those dishes. And I have uh, what is left of them. These are the characters that you're gonna meet in the book pretty much right from the get-go. We talked a little bit about Sophie living in a tenement situation that she wants out of, desperate enough to get out to answer that mail order bride ad from Martin, who's looking for a new wife for himself and a mother for his five-year-old little girl who does not speak by the way. And that's attributed to the fact that she's grieving her mother who died five months earlier. 
the minute she marries Martin, um, she gains a lot of things that she's wanted for a long time, a comfortable home. She hasn't had that in a long time. Nice clothes, good food. She finally has this child to love and she knows she can't have children. And then she's got this rather handsome looking husband, but there's something up with Martin. Things aren't as they seem and she can't quite figure it out. He's aloof, he's mysterious, he's not mean, he's not abusive, he's a good provider, but she can tell there's something up with him, but she dismisses it because she has everything else and she's able to dismiss it until a certain day in April when um, everything starts to crumble. And I mean everything. And I have her come, she's a, an Irish immigrant. I'm gonna skip that slide. This is how she gets to San Francisco. This is a map I used to get around San Francisco. This is what San Francisco looked like um, in 1906. It was a beautiful city. It was called the Paris of the West. 400,000 people lived here. It had this gorgeous city hall courthouse structure that was like a block long. You can see part of it there on the right. If you move our tiled faces over, you can see the entire picture. Here's another picture of that city hall courthouse monstrosity. It was um, huge, took 26 years to build at a cost of unbelievable $6 million. And just note those beautiful columns there along the facade of the, um, of the building itself. Um, this is a picture of um, California Street, one of the busier streets in San Francisco, the Palace Hotel, the Cliff House. These are all things that made San Francisco, the Paris of the West, a very desirable place to live. Many, many millionaires lived here, beautiful homes. Lots of people became rich with the railroad and the gold rush. So it was a city of very affluent people. This is the day before, this is the day before the earthquake. Someone took a picture and dated the back April 17, 1906. And this is a picture I said I was gonna show you where everything looks fine. I mean, it looks great. Um, but, the, but the next day at a little after five in the morning, um, things are gonna be very different. And this is a picture that I used to remind myself that things aren't as they seem. Um, this is again, just a picture of what happened on that day. This is what became of San Francisco then um, because of the earthquake. And then because the earthquake was so violent, a lot of substandard buildings fell over right away. The bigger buildings that were built with um, you know, concrete foundations or built of brick or stone, they, a lot of those were able to withstand the earthquake with minimal damage. But what happened was the earthquake broke all of the water mains underground and broke all the gas lines that were piped into all the houses and buildings. And those gas lines sparked fires within seconds all over the place. There were fires everywhere and no water to put them out. And as these fires burned, because there was plenty to burn, it's a big, big city, uh, they emerged and became this wall, this towering inferno of flame that was just devouring the city. And so it looked like this three days later. This is a picture that was taken from an airship about five weeks afterward. You can see that's the city hall there in the background. It's a hulking skeleton afterward. And um, the whole thing had to be um, raised and they had to start over. These are some pictures of during the fire itself. This is Sacramento Street. Um, this is the city hall after the fire and after the quake, you can see those beautiful columns. They fell right after the quake, they fell. They did not withstand the quake. And then the fire came and just blew through the whole thing and turned it into a ruin. This is also Sacramento Street. This is from Knob Hill. So you're looking down from Knob Hill towards the ferry building at the very back there. And the ferry building is still there. I've been through it many times. It's a beautiful building now full of, it's a food hall, lots of artisans. Um, there's a farmer's market there. There's a bookstore there. Um, and so it did survive the quake. It's one of the few things downtown uh, that did. These are some houses on Howard Street, just below Mission. And that Fairmont Hotel there on the right, it was almost done. It was gonna be San Francisco's next most luxurious hotel. And it was like two weeks from its day, from its like opening day. And um, it survived the quake, but not the fire. And if you get the book, you might notice this picture. This picture was used, I think I have a copy here. It was used for the cover of the book. So when you look at the cover of the book behind these figures of Sophie and Kat, you'll see that, that picture and it's the cable lines the, for the cable cars. You can see how the earthquake shifted them all to the right. Now to stop the firestorm, I think I'll probably stop the presentation with these pictures. The fire was uncontrollable. There was no way of putting it out. They tried dynamiting buildings here and there to stop the fire, to deprive it of fuel, but there was no stopping it because it was so big. 
So they made this very difficult decision to dynamite 20 blocks of beautiful homes, just like these. These are the, these are some of the ones they had to dynamite on Van Ness Avenue. Van Ness is this wide, beautiful boulevard that runs north and south. And there were houses on the right side and houses on the left. And all the houses that were on the east side, they dynamited. And, and there are beautiful houses too on, on the west side that they did not. And um, which is really sad because they were beautiful, beautiful, expensive homes and they had survived the quake. Most of them had survived the quake because they were made so well, but they dynamited them to stop the fire. It deprived the fire of its fuel, of its food. And because, because Van Ness was such a wide boulevard, the fire couldn't jump it. It, it couldn't jump it. So um, the sacrifice of those beautiful homes is what stopped uh, the fire eventually. So, which is really sad. You go down Van Ness now and everything on it is pretty much new <laughs> on the east side. And you know, you know what a terrible price um, they had to pay to, um, you know, to, to stop the fire. I think what I will do is I'll skip through some of these. Um, these are recovery photos and I'll just move. These are some pictures of side by sides of then and now. But I just want to move to, um, you might be wondering, well, how long did it take for San Francisco to recover? And actually, uh, within nine years, it's unbelievable, within nine years, the World's Fair was hosted there. And so within nine years, they had these beautiful exhibition halls like this one here. It was uh, along um, waterfront property. There are all these beautiful boulevards and galleries and um, exhibitions and concerts. And between um, February and December of 1915, like 18 million people came to San Francisco um, to, to come to the World's Fair. It celebrated the completion of the Panama Canal. And uh, it just, it's amazing to me that, it, it, that the city was able to recover and rebuild itself. And if you're wondering, did anybody help San Francisco? Well, within three days of the disaster, just with, from within the US alone, like we're talking all the other sister states, um, $5 million was sent to San Francisco. Like New York was one of the most generous states and um, individuals also wrote checks and sent them like the Rockefeller family just wrote a check to help San Francisco rebuild. And during the worst parts of the recovery when there was no food and all these people living in tent cities in green spaces and Presidio and the Golden Gate Park, people um, from all over were sending um, train loads of provisions, cots and tents and bedding and money. And so I, I feel like the US really rallied around San Francisco and California in particular. And maybe that's why they were able to rebuild so quickly. But they really were like a phoenix rising from the ashes. And it's kind of a, it was a good picture for me because if you've been to San Francisco now, you know, it's kind of a jewel of a city. It's very urban, very different, very vibrant, energetic, very expensive. It's got its own feel. And it, it does feel, to me, it's hard to believe there was that amount of, of damage, that big of a disaster um, here because of how beautiful and amazing it is now. And it's kind of a picture for me too of Sophie when, she, um, I, I can't tell exactly because it will ruin the story for you, but something happens just before the earthquake that unseats, it unseats her. And then of course the earthquake comes and the crumbling is complete. And now she has to regain, reshape, redefine her life. And, you know, can she do it? And with the help of people that she is going to meet, um, she's able to, you know, do, do what she needs to do to begin the tough work of recovery after loss. And, and then, of course, you have beautiful San Francisco to show us what can happen when you not only have, you know, motivation, determination, but strong arms around you to help you rise again. So anyway, I hope those pictures are helpful to you. Um, by the way, I'm going to stop sharing. By the way, um, those pictures that I showed you of Kat and Martin and Sophie are not like real people. My characters are, are fictional, but I found those and thought they represent my, my character as well. So that, that's why I had those pictures for you. So we have a question actually from Susan on the Facebook page. Are those pictures in the book? Overall, the pictures that you the were pictures, showing us? Yes, the pictures are not in the book, but there, um, there are lots of pictures available to you. Um, in the National, Ar National Archives and Library of Congress. And if you go on my website, there's a really lovely um, book club discussion guide um, that has some of those pictures in this beautiful PDF guide. Do be careful though, to, that if you decide to look at that uh, or download it onto your computer to look at, that the discussion questions for your book club are revelatory. 
So don't read the discussion questions ahead of time. They're, they're, they're spoilers in a way because some of the discussion that you want to have is about things I reveal to you during the story. So just make sure that you don't read the discussion questions about the book until you've read the book. But some of those pictures that I've shown you are in that. Um, we have a question from Sharon. Are there any buildings still standing that were there during the World Fair? Um, the World's Fair buildings, I never came across any of those. I do, I do not think they were built to last. Um, I did not see any. It could be that I was not in the right place at the right time and I just missed them, but I do not think so. I could be wrong. I should probably look that up and um, I'll, I'll find out. So the next time someone asks, I'll have a better answer. You know, just what you were saying at the beginning with the stuff about the earthquake, that did make me laugh because I realized being a Southern California girl myself, it is a different kind of mindset when you you have grown up with the idea that the ground underneath you is not an entirely reliable thing. And actually, this it, it's the kind of thing where it, it it becomes very clear to you. I don't know if you have a funny earthquake story. I do. I was in my I was something like eight years old, and I read through the biggest earthquake that of my entire family. It was a very good book in my defense, but my father sticking his head through the door saying, "Are you okay? Are you okay?" And I'm like what? It, I had not even noticed the earth was swinging like a hammock underneath me. And uh, the, other one I can think, <laughs> the other one I can think of is moving to Maryland. And I'd only been there about a week and I'm in a gym getting a membership packet and an earth, the earthquake hits Maryland in like 20, 2012, something like that. It was the one that it really rocked Maryland. But the funny thing was, it's like you spot the California girl in the crowd because everybody else is diving under tables and shrieking. And there's me in the middle going, what? This is not even a six pointer. This is what we stir our coffee with in San Diego. In San Diego. It's true. I grew up not really being afraid of earthquakes. I have more respect for them now that I'm older and especially after researching this book. And the scary thing about the San Andreas Fault is our part, the San Diego, California, you know, Southern California, that part of San Andreas has been silent for 300 years, which seismologists say just make it ripe for something to happen. And uh, so I, I have more respect now than I than I used to, but I think it's because I grew up feeling them. You know, you have a couple of year, maybe more, and maybe only one like sizable one where you think maybe I should go get into a doorway like they tell you to do um, and we've never we've never really had a big one here which is good except that it makes us ripe for one yeah I kind of feel like though you know the minute you and I end up in somewhere like Kansas and see our first tornado <laughs> that's when it'll be everybody else's job to stare at us like while we're freaking out and, then, and to say yes what just you know fingers come down from the sky periodically and wreck everything what's your problem it's true. it's true we lived in minnesota for quite a while and i i had a very healthy fear of tornadoes and, and it, it was different than the than the you know the apprehension that my minnesota you know tried and true native friends had they were careful too but i was downright afraid of those tornadoes and they were just careful it's different <laughs> So we have a question from Sarah, and that is how many lives were lost overall, like generally speaking, from the earthquake and the fire? Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, it was 3,000 total. So there were 1,000 deaths that first day. So 1,000 deaths that were probably more related to the quake than the fires, although there were fire deaths by the end of that first day. So um, the, all told, they're thinking about 3,000. And the thing, it's one thing I do want to emphasize about this book too, just in case you're thinking that, you know, it's a disaster book, it's all going to be about the disaster. It really isn't. And that's one thing I love about uh, this book is that, you know, a lot of this book is set up, you know, about a third of the book is, you know, you're getting to know and care for this family, these people. And then, you know, an earthquake goes off, not on in the ground, but in Sophie's life. And then almost immediately after that, the earthquake goes off for real in the ground. Right. Feet. And then about a third of the book is the earthquake itself. And it's and it's uh, not just the quake, but the destruction, the fire, the fleeing, you know, everything that goes on with through that disaster. And then there's aftermath. And I'm so glad you included that because aftermath fascinates me. It's not just what happens during a crisis like a war mm -hmm. and for my books i tend to write a lot about wars but you know disasters certainly count as well but when you're in the middle of a war or a crisis or a natural disaster there's a certain mindset that your your brain will force you into which just says just don't think about what comes after just get through it 
right. But yeah. then you get through it and then you have to take stock of what you've lost and maybe what you've gained mm -hmm. and think what comes next. Exactly. I think there's something that happens when the dust settles and now you're, now you're working with, okay, this is what's left or this is what's left of me, or this is what is left to me. Now, what am I going to do? Because after an event that's that redefining, that changes everything to that degree, then, you know, you have to start walking the next day, um, the rest of your life, you're still having to live it. So you, you're already, you're working on the very next thing, whatever it may be, whether it's just, you know, finding a place, a safe place to live, safe place to sleep. But, you know, every day of your recovery after loss, after that kind of catastrophe, you are kind of learning, you're like learning your way through the, the, the recovery period. And for some people, recovery is something that takes, you know, the rest of your life is learning how to live with the effects of loss. And um, which is not a bad thing, I don't think, to, to know that um, something that shaped you, that we, where you had to go through a loss, um, that you still kind of carry that lesson with you. Otherwise, it seems like we would have to go through those lessons again if we didn't remember them. I think it's good to remember the lessons we learned during loss so that we don't have to repeat them. Well, it also, I'd say something too that I loved about the, the rebuilding part of this book and as well as the crisis part of this book is, is that you have these, and I'm trying to say this without it, I will say this without spoilers, I promise. You have women who are thrown together. Sophie is one of them. I will not tell you who the others are, but women who are thrown together who actually have every reason to react badly to each other. They have very potent reasons not to um, not to look at each other with great fondness or kindness, but instead they pull together. And it's a kind of you know sisterhood that's wonderful to see. And I really do like, you know, seeing that. So I, cause I love seeing this sort of band of friends thing that women can have where there's not the easy cliche of let's go right for the cat fighting or let's go right for this or that. And I'd say, I, I love it. I, I, it doesn't surprise me seeing that from Sue because we have a great band of San Diego author friends in this area. And in normal times we get together for launches and things and, you know, uh, it's a wonderfully supportive group. But I did in that too, that this is very much a band of sisters kind of booked. Yeah, when I was um, formulating the story in my head, I kind of had in the back of my mind, it's Titanic meets Big Little Lies. You know, you've got this disaster and then you've got this group of women who don't seem like they have a whole lot in common and, and yet they do. And then something, uh, some sort of tragedy or tragic event bonds them. And it's not because they like each other. You know, it's not because they met at the gym or, or at the dog park. You know, they met because of disaster. And yet there are, there are some important things that they do have in common that, you, that unite them in, in a common purpose that I can't tell you about. But if you, if you liked Big Little Lies by Leon Moriarty, then you might, and if, if you've read this book, then you might know what I, what I mean. If you haven't read my book yet, but you have read Leon's book, then just keep that in mind as you're reading it. That I, that's what I was thinking all while I was writing was how those women in that book kind of like came together to support each other, even though their lives were really kind of disconnected. Now, uh, I just want to put a word out to the people who are watching. We can definitely keep talking, but if you have questions, please do um, open it up, uh, put your questions in. Uh, Warwick will put them in the chat for us to read, or Julie can come back and feed them to us. Um, but do please uh, put your questions in. We're happy to open it up a little bit more to Q&A at this point. We have lots of questions flying in. All right. Fine. <laughs> I couldn't type them fast enough to put into the chat. So I think I just better pop on and start reading them. <laughs> Everybody. And Susan, you have, and Kate, you both have tons of fans out there that are watching this. We have people from all over the country watching. Maryland, oh, Michigan, all over the place. They're a little colder than we are out here right now, though. <laughs> and some, some were commenting that they do remember that earthquake in Maryland, Kate. So um, they were there too <laughs> during that. So um, let me get over, let me do one thing here and get over to the um, chat that's happening. Okay, Joseph has a two-part question. Um, his was, San Francisco has a big homeless problem now. Was homelessness a problem back in 1905? And then the second part is, is there a way to predict earthquakes? I don't think there is, but I'll let you take yeah. that one. Yeah, as far as the homeless population, I think it was 
different than I, I did not come up against, I didn't, I, there was no uh, research that led me to believe that it was the same or worse than it is now. And you're right, right now, the homeless population in San Francisco is, is it's troubling to me as a visitor and tourist, and then just as a human. Um, but what they did have um, there where they had kind of these nefarious um, neighborhoods, like the Barbary Coast, which is gone now, it burned down in the earthquake. But that's where um, a lot of poor people lived. It was where um, there was unfortunately a lot of crime there. And I think if there was a homeless, homeless population, it was probably um, probably somewhere in the in the Barbary Coast neighborhoods. Um, I feel like um, because San Francisco is so, like today, San Francisco is so very expensive. It doesn't take much to make you homeless. You know what I mean? It's like, it's so, it's so expensive that um, you could have a job and still not be able to afford rent and still be living on the streets or living in your car or something like that. But I don't know that it was any worse um, back then. And as far as predicting an earthquake, there's no way to predict one. Seismologists and the Richter scale, which was developed 30 years after this quake, and Charles Richter developed that scale for measuring magnitude. Um, they, can, they can chart the slightest little movement, like even the movement, like a, a, an earthquake that's like two on the, on the Richter scale, we don't even feel that, but they can measure it. They, they, they see it, the needle moves, they can measure it and record it, but they can't predict it. All they can do is they can predict with probability. Like there was a recent study a year ago put out that for my part of California, Southern California, it's probable that there will be an earthquake six or greater and the, um, the San Francisco one is 7.9, six or greater within the next 30 years of 19, 19%. So there's a 19% chance probable chance that there will be an earthquake in Southern California of a magnitude six or greater, but they can't predict when or even that it will, just that it's probable. So for all of you who are envying our nice weather here, um, yes, it is warmer here. It's very nice. But on the other hand, you are probably not sitting on a coast that is going to end up floating in the nearest body of water. <laughs> well, the trouble is San Diego is on the Pacific side of that San Andreas oh, yeah, fault. Okay. We're on the Pacific side. We're on the water side. And that's, that's the joke of why they, there was always been this joke that Southern California is going to fall into the ocean. Well, that's why yeah. we're on the water side of those two gigantic plates. We'll become an island, right? Well, may, that that would be the best scenario is that we became an island instead of just, instead of becoming Atlantis. I instead think that's, of becoming that's Atlantis, better. let's let's think about us becoming yes. an island. <laughs> yeah, island would be better. <laughs> exactly. And Kay, you were so right earlier about how you know earthquakes. You know, when people live in other parts of the country, they think, "Oh my God, it's shaking out there all the time." And I would take the potential shaking from hurricanes and tornadoes, though. Sorry, I just and those come every year. <laughs> That's true. That is true. Okay. So um, Dave is writing, and I'm going to pose this to both of you, and Kate will go with you first on this one. Do you have any plans to write about the current pandemic? Well, I'm laughing because A, Sue already did, and B, no, <laughs> not me. <laughs> I think having lived through it is um, enough. Uh, and um, who knows, maybe a few years down the line would be, or some decades down the line might be a time to um, explore that. But, you know, there's that whole saying that comedy is tragedy plus time. You know, it feels a little too close to, uh, in history, to think about writing about this, I have to say. Yeah, talk about predicting the future. Um, your book a few years ago. <laughs> That's who knew you were predicting? <laughs> I know, who knew? I, who knew? No, nobody could have known. So I feel like I've already written about a pandemic, like what, what a pandemic can do to a family. And I always write about families or individuals or relationships. And I've already, I think, I feel like I've already covered that material. And I write historical fiction. I don't plan to change. And for me, historical fiction has to be at least 50 years in the past. And I don't think I'll be here in 50 years. I don't, I don't think so. I don't I think don't I'll know. be. With, I don't, the, with the way technology is. I don't know. Okay, this I don't is wanna... a question that I always love too. Um, really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think others will write about it because, and I, but I think we should wait until we're on the other side and we figured out what we learned. Like, what did this experience um, teach us? What, what are we going to take with us when we move on to the next phase of our lives? 
So I don't want anybody to be too quick to write it about. I think we should let it just marinate for a little while and see what it, what it is that this time in our lives, um, how did it impact us? So it might be a couple of years, I think, before, um, before I, I would think, before I would probably even want to buy a book that's contemporary right. that's right. set during this time. I kind of agree with you on that because I just think, you know, it's, it's almost like we're all living it. I yeah. don't know. It would feel almost like a magazine article to a right. certain extent. Right. You know. Um, okay. And I always love this question too. Um, how did you come up with the title? Was, and was that always the working title? The title came to me rather quickly and I loved it right away. And so the whole time I'm writing the book, I just want to be able to keep it because Kate knows that you can, you can write a book with a title, but then you turn it into your editor and you know, the editor and publicity and marketing and um, the booksellers, um, they all get together and decide, is this the title that will sell the book? And sometimes they think, no, it's not. And, um, but this one I really wanted to keep. And I was really glad there was no discussion about keeping it. Because for me, it says a lot. It was, for me, it's, in a very evo it's an evocative title because the nature of fragile things is if you drop it, it will break. That's the nature of something fragile. And I wanted to suppose that not everything that looks fragile actually is. Things aren't always as they seem. And women back then had little agency. They were seen as fragile creatures. And um, I set out to prove that, well, they're, they're not actually, especially when they get together under a common purpose. And I think both of you writing about women in history, and I mean, us who have grandmothers who lived during those times, they were a lot tougher than I think I am. <laughs> right? Yes, I agree. You know, some of the stuff that they did and they had to do, it's like, I think about my life and, and the conveniences and things that we have. It's like, we're so spoiled. <laughs> it's true. You know, they were, they were tough ladies. Those, mm -hmm. those ladies that lived in the early part of this century or I guess the last one we're in, yeah. in now. Um, okay, so um, kind of a, a, a dual question here. Sarah's asking about one thing and Susan's asking, so we're going to kind of combine them a little bit. They want to know what, and it's to both of you, what your favorite book was last year that you read. So Susan, we'll start with you first, or what's on your TBR list? Gosh, my favorite from last year. I read some really good books last year. Um, gosh, I will. I'll mention two because I, I think I might have a hard time picking just the one. I loved The Exiles by Christina Baker Klein. Just loved it. I, I would read it again. I, I probably will, but I loaned it to my daughter. And the other one is William Kent Kruger's, um, oh, not this Ordinary, Tender Land. the other one, This Tender Land. That just, both of those books just hit me in, in, in a, just a, I don't know, maybe it's because of what we're going through, but both of them just made me glad people write books. So yeah, yeah both of those. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. How about you, Kate? Oh, that's, I actually literally pulled up my year-end blog post to pull the titles. I know, because I always forget the titles too. Um, I adored A Treachery of Spies by Amanda Scott. That was like the World War II French Resistance book that blew everything else out of the water for me. Unbelievably complicated and gripping. And I loved The Flight Portfolio by Julie Oranger, mm -hmm. who always has the ability to basically rip my heart out and stamp on it in the most casual, casual way. Um, I love Mexican Gothic by oh, yeah. Sylvia That's Moreno amazing. Garcia. It's like Bluebeard's Castle meets Rebecca in a Mexico City <laughs> background. It's, been, it's, it's great. Um, and let's see, I loved the really twisty Seven Deaths of Evelyn Hardcastle by Stuart Turton. It was God's Day meets Downton Abbey. And it was just, it just blew my, it blew my brain. I was like, that was one of those books I turned, I finished it. And then I turned back to the beginning and read it again, because I wanted to see how it was put together. I, that's one of those books that's always like been on my bubble and been on my stack, but it's never quite bubbled up. But so many people have said that about that. And we'll say it again, for those of you who are, it's the seven. Seven deaths of Evelyn Hardcastle. Yeah. Although I think the UK title is the seven and a half deaths. Yes. Right. AB thing. You may, uh, so you may, uh, end up with a little confusion there but i will also say to one more thing if you're looking for a companion read to sue's book uh melanie benjamin just came out with a wonderful book called mm. the children's blizzard which has a similar thing of a large group of sympathetic characters tossed on top of a natural disaster in her case it's a blizzard mm. so it's a wonderful if you're looking for books on natural disasters that have this wonderful focus on really great deep characters and how 
a disaster defines them. These would be two great books to read back to back or side by side if you want like a buddy read. So I'm going to throw that out there because Melanie's book is great. Yeah. And that's the thing too, that I think that we, you know, you all take a little while to write your book. So we have to find other people's books to like fill in those gaps for us who, who those of us who are reading a little quicker. <laughs> um, so Arlene wants to know, Susan, what was your favorite part about writing this book? Favorite part? I think the favorite part was um, crafting the mystery. I don't always get to do that with my books. This one lent itself to a mystery thread that was just lots of fun to write. And I love Louise Penny. I'll read, I'll read anything she writes. And so I don't know if I was able to um, like learn from her by reading her. <laughs> But I, but I, I think I pulled it off. I've been told I, I, that I pulled it off. That there's a, there's a, there's something that's revealed at the end that people didn't see coming, and so that the fact that I was able to do it when I don't really have a lot of practice with that is very, um, that was very satisfying. Fun. And Arlene has a question for you too, Kate. Um, what inspires you in writing your books, especially the forthcoming one, The Rose Code? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I generally look for women in history who have done something fantastic and you know who have been involved in something you know absolutely breathtakingly jaw-droppingly cool and who maybe have not received as much credit as they deserve for it or sometimes not any credit at all and i look for women like that because i want to write about them and the fun part about that is that I get to learn about women who just blow my mind and make me make me envious, make me want to be them and make me want to befriend them and make me definitely want to do my part to shine a light on them. And sometimes, and it also it exposes me to a huge range of the things that women have done in history. And sometimes these things are, you know, physically badass, you know, like in when I wrote about the Huntress, this was about women who were, you know, doing all night bombing runs, you know, on Nazis, you know, to defend their homeland, you know, which is incredibly physically taxing and dangerous. And then yet when I wrote The Rose Code, this is about women code breakers of Bletchley Park who were physically really quite safe during the war. You know, their job was, their job was mental. It was, and the, the, journey they went on and the kind of, you know, terrible pressures they went under were emotional and intellectual instead. So that was a different kind of challenge to write. But it was still, they, both sets of women impressed me equally because they went through the ringer in their different ways and they came out stronger for it at the end. And it was just felt like such a privilege as well as such a joy to write their stories. Well, I'm reading through some of the, oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. I'm going to chime in really quickly to say that I read an early copy of the Rose Code and it is phenomenal. Really, really, really good. Yeah, no, it's, it, I, I put that it's like, you, you've done it again, Kate. Yeah. <laughs> and that's not easy to do. It's hard to keep, it's hard to keep that yeah. up. Um, it's hard because you raise the bar with each book, you know, exactly. thought, well, <laughs> there's never going to be a book as good as The Huntress. Well, this one's, this is now my favorite Kate Quinn book. So there you go. Yeah, same, same, same. Um, somebody was commenting earlier that they said they'd rather deal with snow than being an island in the Pacific Ocean. So just throwing that out there. <laughs> We're going to take one final question because there's so many. Well, there was another comment that said you two should. I don't know if either. I know Kate collaborates, but they're saying that you two need to collaborate on a book. So That'll they're just fun. they're just tossing that out there. <laughs> so our last question is going to come from Brittany. Um, and we're going to pose it to both of you. Um, so we'll start with Susan. You, we'll start with you first. Are there any, well, actually, Kate, okay, we're going to start with you and then we'll close with Susan. So we'll start with you first, Kate. Are there any time period historical events that you dream about, that you dream of writing about, but haven't had the opportunity to yet? Does your setting usually come first or the characters or a mix? Um, for me, um, usually it'll be, again, a woman who comes first or a group of women and when I find them, you know, so that usually ties a setting with it, you know, since I talked about finding these women of history who have done something fantastic. So usually a setting is tied with that, you know, although sometimes I will have an idea that's a little more open-ended, like, you know, at some point, sometime, somewhere, I wanted to write a book about a woman spy. And then, you know, eventually I finally found, oh, there was a bit of history, the Alice Network that, you know, finally gave me the opportunity to do that. But, I would say that um, there are plenty of places, events, times, and that I would love to write about, but I haven't gotten to yet. And um, 
I will say completely honestly, uh, one of them is the San Francisco earthquake. <laughs> Um, I've always wanted, I have some books on that. I have a plot idea for that. Like when I was writing, coming up with the idea for the Rose Code, I literally had three ideas, which I submitted a one page thing on each one to my agent and my editor. And like one was the Bletchley Park idea. One was a novel about the suffragette movement. And one was a, a um, and one was a San Francisco earthquake book. That's right. And uh, it ended up being the Rose Code. It ended up being the the Bletchley Park book. But I do have the other idea, which would still on the burner somewhere. So like God knows what I'll do with it or when. But and you know I kind of now feel like I have a hill to climb because it will need to be something both different than mm -hmm. and how could it possibly be as good as the Nature of Fragile Things? Because every book that comes along raises that bar. So um, but yes, I would love to write a San Francisco earthquake book someday. <laughs> There I think you, you should do it. I left a lot of uncovered ground, so to speak. So. <laughs> I don't think it would Good be. A, um, I don't think it would be a stretch to say that performance of Carmen with Enrico Caruso, given my opera background, would. Oh, happen. there you go. I barely mentioned him. I mentioned him once, just in passing. So there you go. I love it. How about you, Susan? Um, there's a, an idea I have that I don't even know how to package it because it's it's so it's gauzy but I loved um, John Steinbeck's um, The Grapes of Wrath in high school it's like my favorite high school read and I've often thought about that book afterward like I've often thought about Rose of Sharon like what became of her and just that whole family and what they went through and the fact that um, you know so much of what happened to them happened in California and I told you already I'm kind of looking for the stories that happened right here so I might take a look at um, some of these people from Oklahoma and other states that were affected, you know, by the Dust Bowl and came this direction and what they went through to try and um, eke out a living to rebuild their lives. And um, I think there's, I think there are untold stories there too, but I'm, but like, I don't have the, I don't have like an idea yet. I just know that I, Rose of Sharon just stays with me year after year after year after year. And so maybe someday. And then for me, the uh, idea usually um, is the event is first and then characters come to it. Like I knew I wanted to write a book about the San Francisco earthquake because I thought this is a metaphor for what it, what it means to have your whole world crumble around you. And we use that imagery all the time to talk about when it seems like life is just, we can't go on, life is too difficult. Like for some people, this might feel like an earthquake, what we're going through right now. And so, you know, we, we grasp for a handhold and sometimes it feels like we're running for our lives. And it's because it, because it seems like the world beneath our feet is crumbling and how scary that is. And I thought that I could use an earthquake as a metaphor for that when it seems like your whole world is crumbling. But then I thought, well, who am I going to give that story to? What characters am I going to give that metaphor to? And that's why I think the first try didn't work. I had the wrong characters. Mm. They just weren't worthy of it. They just weren't worthy of it. And then the second go around, I had Sophie, but I didn't have everybody else. And I needed I needed to complete this idea that the cast had to be worthy of the event. And that's why I think the third the third time I was able to dial into the right cast. Fantastic. Well, it's well done you. Um, we are, we can, like you said, Kate, we can go on. I mean, the questions are still coming. So we'll try to answer some of them. Somebody asked in there earlier if we could um, write in what the books were that you guys uh, mentioned. So I'll try to remember and type those in. But that's a good point to you, Kate. Um, where can people follow you? You mentioned a blog that maybe has some of your favorite books in it. What's the best way for people to find you if they're looking for your thoughts on things? Oh, um, you can find me on Facebook, uh, katequinnauthor.com. You can find me on Instagram, uh, katequinn5975. And I, and you can find me on Twitter, katequinnauthor. Um, I'm always talking about various books that I love. Um, for my about anything about my own webs, uh, my own books, I have my website, which is again katequinnauthor.com. And I do have a blog there, which I don't do a lot with it, but I do have lists of my books that I love and generally year by year. So if you want to see what were my top 20 books of 2020, I've got a list there. So you easy to find it. So that's where I'm going to direct anybody who's watching. Go to Kate's website, look at the blog, you'll find her list. And then I think Susan, your two books were The Exile and This Tender Land. So I remembered those. So those are those are in there. So, <laughs> so, so Susan, the other, where well, oh, sorry, Kate, what? And for the other disaster book, the Melanie Benjamin that's Jeffrey. Right. Right. That's right. Uh, somebody put somebody did write that in there that they love that book too. So Susan, where should people go to find you and find more about what's going on with you? 
Well, if you're interested in book type news about me, Instagram is probably where I spend the most time talking about other books that I'm reading. And uh, my handle there is S-O-O-Z Meisner. So it's Suze Meisner is my Instagram handle. And I usually post about what I'm reading and talk about what I'm reading. My Facebook page is Susan.Meisner on Facebook. That's my author page. And I I spend probably as much time talking about books there, but other things too uh, in the art world, literary world. And I do have a blog on my website, SusanMeisner.com, but I forget to feed it. So right now it's starving. But I think the last book I read and loved on my blog was Britt Bennett's The Vanishing Half, which was so good. I would read that book again too. You can put that one on the list as well. There you go. (laughs) Well, this was launch day. Um... We so appreciate you spending launch day with us. I, for anybody out there, we got a couple of minutes here. Typically launch day is what? And what was different this year? I well, mean, I'm sure a lot of it's still a lot of like interviews yeah. and stuff, right? Yeah, you know, for this particular day itself, I would be getting ready to go to Warwick's and um, I, I would be preparing like party favors and door prizes and giveaways because, you know, I like to have a party when I have a lunch day at Warwick's and um, okay, we're not doing that. We're doing this instead. And I'm happy to be doing this. What the, the big difference is tomorrow. Tomorrow I would have been on a plane and, and I'm not. And the next day I would have been in a different city and the next day a different city. And we're not, I'm not doing that. I'm doing that virtually. So it's the same, but different, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. It's, not, it's not all bad because there are people that um, could not come to the Warwick's event if it had been live. Um, but they can come to this and right. the same with the other venues, the other Zoom appearances that I'll be having is anybody can go to those unless it's a private event. And that's something you couldn't do before. If you lived in a state where the author wasn't coming, then you were, you know, you, you may not have been able to hear them present at all. Okay. And so this is the silver lining in that. I try to remember that there is a silver lining. It's little it doesn't shine a whole lot, but it's there. It and is. We can we can go to events that we couldn't have gone to otherwise. It's so true. And for everybody watching, you get double your money here tonight because that's, <laughs> that's another huge silver lining. Because very rarely do two authors line up in a live performance. It's, it's way too hard with there. So this is a beautiful, um, so Kate, thank you for taking the time to do this. This was amazing. Oh no, it's my pleasure. I love this book and I love helping my fellow authors. Although the, the thing I count on for on launch day, which we can't do in a pandemic is that I can't be there in person for Susan, which is what I would like to do and what I have my friends do for me on my launch because the best thing an author friend can do for you, or you know, you you can enlist a spouse and so forth, but especially other writers will do this for you, is they will take you out to lunch, or they will, you know, in some way, forcibly separate you from your computer, <laughs> and by, possibly by confiscating your phone and like putting it, you know, in in the freezer, you know, for the entire duration of lunch, to stop you from hitting refresh on your Amazon sales rankings. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and this is the kind of thing that you really need to have someone in person there to, if necessary, you know, chain you to the kitchen sink to stop you from doing. So I can't do that in person. I can't do that over Zoom. And I am sorry for that, Sue. <laughs> that, that would have been, we probably would have gone for um, happy hour before and, and that would have been fun. But you know yeah. what, this, this too shall pass. Yep. It, will, it will, it will. It will. And we will all be together. And Kate? There might be a chance we're together in July. I don't know. Is that when the book's out? Uh, no, March is when. Oh, March. And March 9th is when. Oh, I was thinking July. Begins. But who knows? Well, um, there might be some chance for some kind of event or not, not in person, probably, but maybe Instagram live or who knows. So we'll hope, to, we'll hope to do something with you. Well, with that, I'm going to say adieu to both of you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. And we will. Well, We will go off Facebook Live. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thanks for coming.